communities and what that looked like. And there was a, a task force that met and they had a lot of, it was difficult at times and uh, finally came up with a package where uh, employees agreed to increase their contributions. We made some changes to the COLAs, um, the length of time and some other structural changes to um, uh, as part of trying to get uh, uh, the underfunding addressed. And then the one thing that we did right at the very end was to say we need to deal with uh, um, employee health care, retiree health care, OPEP is, so you hear it, OPEP is um, other post-employment benefits. And, um, and we had for teachers, uh, health care, uh, retiree health care, and it had never been pre-funded, it was all pay-go. And originally, we were paying for their health care costs out of the corpus of an underfunded pension fund, which only compounded the underfunding. So at the end, we said we need to deal with both the, um, the pension side and the health care side. It's all part of that uh, economic security for retirees. And so we're, I think, going to be talking. Nothing. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of an update of where we are. Uh, those increased contributions went into effect in July. Um, and um, of course, there have been, <laughs> yeah, everybody's going to say, well, what about our assumptions on rate of return? But um, Chris will get into that. But this is really, we passed major legislation, and uh, it's an update. Where are we? What does it look like? Um, and um, then we can sort of take it from there. But oftentimes, after we pass a bill, we never come back and say, right. how are we doing? Um, how was it implemented? You know what are still the outstanding issues so that's why we thought it would be helpful because obviously this ties into a lot of money um when you think about it the underfunding was in the billions of dollars and um and then it gets into the government office piece as it relates to um state employees and um, well the municipals it's, a, it's part of was not part of uh, this at right. all just teachers and state employees so with that background yeah um, i'm going to turn it over to chris to give us that update um on where we are now sure uh, thank you madam chair for the record chris Rip, joint fiscal office i really hope you all had a break from thinking about pensions for a while since, no i uh, have had no break with the exception of the chair but um i wanted to just provide a quick um sort of overview about um, now that we have the fiscal 22 evaluations in for um both the pension systems and the opep systems to see you know how are we doing what has happened over the last year and what impact did uh act 114 that you all passed last year have on the systems so this slide deck sort of assumes that you have some foundational knowledge of pensions so this is really not going to be a 101 level type of presentation but if anybody here would like that type of presentation just reach out to me and i'm happy to do it um if you'd like a little additional background of what happened in the last year or two to sort of get us to this point um i would suggest that the pension task force report that was issued last january would be a very good starting point to get that background but sort of the, the bottom line up front here on the pension systems is that the funded ratios for both the state employee and the teacher systems improved over the last year. And the ADAC savings, the ADAC is how much the actuaries say the employer should pay every year to fully fund the systems, has gone down for FY24 relative to sort of the baseline what we thought it would be. Act 114 last year is the reason the pension systems gained ground uh, last year. If there was no Act 114, uh, the systems would have lost ground and the unfunded liabilities would have increased. Why? Because we had a really, really weak um, investment year last year due to all of the forces happening globally. Um, we had a really, really strong year in FY21 where we had some of the strongest investment returns since the early 1980s. And then we saw pretty significant um, investment losses in the current year. Inflation, as you know, has also been at historic highs in recent years, really at the highest levels uh, for at least 30 years. Um, and that impacts the pension systems in a negative way because 
Uh, salary growth of the active workforce is obviously influenced by uh, inflation, but uh, the cost of living adjustments that current retirees receive are calculated based on the consumer price index. So when the CPI is running high, like it has been, you have larger than assumed COLA benefits being paid out. Just a quick refresher, Act 114 last year, um, that involved $200 million of one-time payments to the pension systems, uh, which went toward the unfunded liabilities. Um, beginning this fiscal year, um, the law uh, calls for what we, what we sort of colloquially refer to as plus payments, above and beyond the actuarially recommended amounts. This year, those plus payments are to be $9 million per system. Next year, $12 million per system. The following year, $15 million per system, and they would remain at $15 million, so each of the systems respectively reaches 90% funding. The impact that those plus payments have is you're essentially making an extra payment every year and further chipping away at your unfunded liability principle, which is saving you interest costs over the long term, and over time is flattening out the growth in your future payments. So the sort of shorthand way to think about it is if you pay a little bit more now, you're going to pay a lot less in the future. And that was very important to the um, retirees, to the unions, um, to have that plus payment. And they were saying, we want you to, and it sort of was how do we figure out how to do that? But by putting in the one-time payment and um, uh, reducing our amortized liability, uh, we were able to save on our debt service side, and so we were able to move money, and, but we had to keep it all, we had to keep everything that was in there and those base increases because of the review and the big mm -hmm. increase in the ADEC. Um, that all had to stay in place to, to make this work, but the plus was one of the things that employees were very, um, very adamant. They, they felt there needed to be uh, some additional um, give on the part of the state and and it wasn't giving them more it was basically giving um a faster pay down um, on the um on the underfunding so that um from a political context that was part of uh, part of the negotiations and, and senator you mentioned the the importance of uh employers sort of paying more the employees who are currently working are also paying more and um that was another sort of key feature of act 114 was um the you know, when the assumptions changed a few years ago the the price of the benefit went up um and, and that's sort of reflected in what we call the normal cost whenever you're an active member making contributions out of your paycheck that's going toward the normal cost of your own future benefits so the total cost went up and I think parties realize that, you know, it it wouldn't be inappropriate for members to pay more in recognition of the fact that the total cost went up. Whenever, for every additional dollar that an employee pays in uh, their contributions, it's a dollar that the employer does not have to pay through the ADAC. And this is particularly significant when it comes to the teacher system because the normal costs are funded out of the ed fund in the teacher system and the unfunded liabilities out of the general fund. So an additional dollar that active members are paying in that system is a saved dollar out of the ed fund. And this will be important when we pivot to the next slide deck about OPEB. Um, the last piece about, uh, about the sort of overall construct in Act 114 was um, members, had a, members of both systems agreed uh, to some minor changes in the cost of living formula for people who were not yet eligible to retire. So the, um, it, it was for folks who are eligible beginning this up the end of FY23. The thinking behind that was you didn't want to cause a mass exodus of people who are already um, eligible to retire to retire. Um, you want to encourage people to work as long as they feel like working. Um, <clears throat> going back to some numbers here, uh, what's happened in the last year? Well, the unfunded liabilities decreased across both systems by $144 million, and the funded ratios improved. So you can see here um, on line five of the, the chart that the state employee unfunded liability went down by $26 million. The teacher unfunded liability went down by just under $118 million. Something that kind of interesting happened in line two and line three, the market value and the actuarial value of assets. You know, the market value of assets declined quite a bit um, by $232 million. That is the reflection of the 
uh, weak global investment market over the last couple of years. But you notice the actuarial uh, value went up. What's going on here? The actuarial value smooths in your investment gains and losses over a five-year period. So um, we had a huge unrecognized market gain in FY21. And in FY22, a lot of that gain started getting smoothed into the math. So whenever you see the um, ratio on line four of the actuarial value to the market value, that's less than 100. That means you have deferred gains that haven't yet been recognized in your funding mass. Think of that as like having a good wind at your back if you're sailing across the lake. The opposite happens if the AVA is higher than 100% of the market value. That means you've got unrecognized losses, and that's a little bit of a wind to your face. Uh, and it's going to drag on your performance in future years when all else is equal. Investment performance, um, both systems had negative investment returns um, due to the global market conditions. The actuaries calculate this slightly differently than VPIC does. I go by how the actuaries calculate it um, because that's how we um, figure out what the funding contributions need to be in future years. Um, like I said, uh, the, the way we have our smoothing method, which is very common in pension systems, is your yearly gains and losses are recognized mm -hmm. over a five-year period. Why does that why does that happen? Well, take a look at how jagged that graph is. Those bars show you the market gains and losses every year. So you can have a year that had you know over 20% gain immediately followed by an 8% loss. The line there shows the actuarial value and how you smooth out that volatility. Why does it matter to smooth out that volatility? It's really hard to adequately budget your pension costs if you're seeing wild fluctuations in it from year to year. So that's why people do the smoothing. Well, something. The one other thing that we did for those who weren't part of that discussion is that we used to use a five-year period to review, and um, and that has been reduced to three because if your assumptions that the actuaries are using turn out to be off, like demographics or uh, you know the rate of return over that period of time, then three years and to true up versus five the five years we really it really hammered us with um the uh, level of underfunding that we we're trying to deal with so one of the changes that the legislature made was to make that review period shorter what is the black line those are the actuarial values so that smooths out that black line reflects the smoothing of the over a five-year period of your investment gains and losses every year. So that kind of averages out the, the peaks and the valleys that can be pretty pretty significant from year to year. And we base the, the funding calculations on that black line. Exactly. So 2021, 20, um, we gained quite a bit. Sure did. That must offset what we lost. Exactly. Part well, of it, exactly. That's the whole thinking behind it, is you're going to have some years that are really good, some years that are not so good, and you smooth it out to, to reduce some of that volatility. But if you look at the entire from 2008 or nine through uh, 2022, there's not many down below. Nope. You know, they're all pretty good. That's, that's exactly right. And you're seeing in 2008 and 2009, those big dips, that was due to the Great Recession. Yeah. One of the really interesting yeah. things. They all took a hit. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and that certainly hurt the systems because that was at the very beginning of our amortization period. So we started our 30-year amortization period with that big hit. Yeah. Um, something that I think is always an interesting data point that's updated every year is this little chart in the bottom right shows you what the most recent sort of five-year, 10-year averages are. So right now, our long-term assumed rate of return is 7%. So you can see that um, the most recent 10-year average on an actuarial basis is just above that. If you looked at these numbers from a year ago, they would have been a little more encouraging. It's just every year it changes a little bit. So past is not a predictor of future results, but it's always interesting to see how things have, have transpired in the past. The next two slides just kind of give you the, the summary of how things are going. Um, this is the state employee system. You can see the red line is the actuarial accrued liabilities. 
That's the present value of how much we owe in future benefits that were earned by the currently retired and currently active workforce. So that is a way of thinking of the present value of what the system is on the hook to pay. How far does that go out when they're when, when they are calculating that value? As far out as uh, there is predictable service credit. It's based on what has been earned up to this point. So um, if you're so a- It's like using the average lifespan of the worker. So all of those assumptions. Yeah, that's a good point though. Everything around pensions is based on long-term actuarial assumptions. So my caveat, which I should have said at the beginning was, nothing about this is set in stone. Everything is subject to change. And everything I'm saying here should assume that all else is held equal. So that's the only way you can really talk about this stuff. We know in fact that all else is never equal from year to year, which is why they do these actuarial valuations on a year to year basis. That's your time to really true up and see what did reality actually end up meaning over the last year for our system. But the red line represents the present value of what the systems owe. <clears throat> Blue line shows the actuarial value of assets, the money on hand to pay those. The gap between those lines is your unfunded liability. And the funded ratio, it, which, uh, uh, matches up to the vertical axis on the right side is just a way of expressing at a point in time how much of the money you have on hand to pay the benefits that are due. So when we have a 69.85% funded ratio, that means that on an actuarial basis, that system at that point in time has 69.8% of the money it needs to pay the benefits that it's expected to pay out. Here's the story for the teacher system. Um, you can see that the funded ratio there is a little bit lower. Um, there's lots of reasons for that that we can have another offline conversation about, but in generally the, the teacher system is, is in a little bit worse shape than the state system is. But both systems did see improvements from year to year in their funded ratios. Let me just use this as an opportunity to say, do not, it's not fiscally prudent to defer payments of these liabilities. And part of what happened with teachers is, which was all, all paid out of the general fund at that point, is that we did not fully fund the ADEC at the time. And there was an argument that, you know, their return on investments would more than make it up. And so I think one year in the chronology, the amount that we paid of the ADEC was less than 40%. So, the lesson that I hope future legislators would learn is that when you have to deal with this and you defer it and you underfund it, when you have to deal with it, it is much, much more difficult and complicated. So when we're thinking about additional, you know, new things that we would like, um, we see it. we've been uh, not fully transferring the money to VHCB. If we had done that in one administration, we would have a thousand more housing units. That's an example of where we're taking current revenue and are we using it to fulfill commitments or are we adding on more spending or something new and at the expense of fulfilling our obligations. So <clears throat> I'm just saying as a, an example, um, deliberate budget decisions to underfund um, come home to roost, and when you end up having to deal with them, just like the health care benefit for teachers, it got put in place, but there really wasn't a funding source other than going to an underfunded pension system. And so we finally dealt with that a few years ago um, to go to a PAYGO um, and not put greater pressure, but we never did a pre-funding at the time the benefit got in place. So from a budgetary perspective, um, the only thing I can say, if there's lessons to be learned, it's don't defer because, uh, you know, a promise made is a debt unpaid. Right. And you, we have to make sure that we are not making short-term decisions that have a very long-term cost. I'll get off my soapbox, but I have to say a year ago in December, um, I spent most of December, and Chris had the benefit of my company, um, <laughs> and where we worked to put together this whole financial package to respond to the underfunding and getting pre-funding for, for the healthcare piece. But um, 
and and I think we've moved ourselves forward, but I'm just pleading with people because some of us are not going to be around here forever. That um, there's a lesson and, and memories are short term, but um, it 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 is something just to don't repeat this experience. Is what I'm pleading with you. Yes, yeah, Senator Weston. So the ch two charts that you've just shown is this is based on the assets that are in there now for including um, the decisions that we made. So are you saying we between the two we still have a three um, um, billion or whatever it is whole? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, even with the decisions we made. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we're closing it and we're adding the plus and so yeah, no, I know. But yeah, don't think we've, yeah, don't think we're I asked the question knowing the answer. Senator, it, it, it's a very good question and I think it's a. And a he good, knows the answer. He's just reinforcing well, what I said. And, 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 <laughs> you should never ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. But the, uh, no, I, you're right, Senator, that, you know, is it, only in this world does two hundred million dollars seem like kind of a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Um. And, and it was not an insignificant investment that was made. It was a very significant investment. There still is a long way to go. Most of the financial benefit to the state's balance sheet from Act One Fourteen was really reflected in the OPEB, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But uh, just to your just to follow up before I move on, um, take a look here at two thousand eight. The state system was 94% funded. Um, it was, I'm on slide six, the prior one. Um, okay, so we're still on this one. Yeah, the I don't have 2007 on here because this just kind of looks at the current amortization period, but that system was 100% funded in 2007. Um, if you go over to the teacher system, you notice that it started in 2008 80% funded, much lower. The reason why it was so much lower entering the amortization period is because from 1979 through 2006, the state only fully funded the ADAC mm -hmm. four times. And every time you underfund the ADAC, you have to repay that money with interest in all your future ADACs. So this is something that we had to spend a lot of time explaining to the task force that, you know, the whole the ADAC is a dynamic figure. It gets recalculated every year. So if you short the payment, it doesn't mean there's just a perpetual hole in the system. That hole gets filled back somehow, and it gets filled back with interest through higher future ADAC payments. So it kind of goes back to you pay now or you pay more later. It's sort of Mary yeah. Poppins and compounding. It, that's <laughs> all it is. <laughs> Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the power of compounding. If you don't put it in, it's not compounding. Not. Exactly. The so other thing is <clears throat> as legislators, you really want to pay attention to the proposed budgets that come through because back back when we were in good shape, we were told by the administration, while well, there's all kinds of money, it's going to roll in, and like James said, you know, the investments are going to keep this all great, and well, you can see what happened, and um, so you will eventually, some of you will be in this room, uh, possibly, and. Um, uh, you want to pay attention to the budget. I think by what, 2038? Yeah. Um, it might be a new room. It might be. <laughs> 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 a lot of us. We may not even be upright at that point. But um, why don't we keep going? Um, All right. This, this chart here, aims, this figure aims to summarize so in both pension systems what's happened over the last year. So um, something important is if you see a negative value here, a bar below the line, that's a good thing. That is an actuarial gain. That is something that lowered the unfunded liability. Positive values, not so good. Those are factors that increase the unfunded liability. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. these are expressed in millions. Um, you'll see that um, uh, the contributions um, from Act 114, you can see the $200 million uh, reflected right there. Um, along with the changes to plan provisions, primarily the changes to the COLA benefit that was in both systems. 
but despite those gains, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, headwinds the last uh, year, and a lot of it was really due to the broader economic forces that are just battering retirement systems all across the country. You can see the impact of the investment experience. Um, that is our actuarially calculated invest. That is the gap between the actuarial gain and the assumption. So um, I think that the actuarial gain was that we still had 5% positive due to the smoothing. But since that was below 7%, that means we have an actuarial loss. And, and the difference, it's added to the unfunded liability. Retirements and net turnover are always something to pay attention to. Um, those are sort of two sides to the same coin. Retirements are how many people are working until retirement. They tend to be your more expensive um, members for a system. Turnover is sort of the opposite. It's how many people entered and left the workforce for a reason other than immediately retiring. They tend to be your less expensive members. Um, but when everything nets out, you can see the, the total net impact on the far right of the, uh, the gain of, of 26 million for the state and just under 118 million for the uh, teachers. Something interesting to, to keep in mind is um, on the far left, you see this contributions in minus the normal cost and interest. That's how I show the impact of your amortization. Um, and right now, um, we have what's called a level percent of pay system, where unlike your mortgage at home, where you pay the same amount every year for 30 years, our systems are deliberately designed for the payments to increase in roughly 3% increments on pace with payroll growth. So the thinking is the dollar amount goes up every year, but as a total percent of your budget, it stays relatively constant and manageable. The downside to that kind of system is you're, it, you really have to get about halfway through the amortization period till your payments really grow enough to start chipping away at your principal. We are now at that point. So you know, if there wasn't a $200 million um, one-time payment made, you still would have seen some relatively modest gains from positive amortization. That trend is gonna continue in the future years. It, think of it as your, your principal payments are really backloaded toward the last few years. The ADAC, so um, you'll see here, um, every year on the valuations, they will show what the actuaries recommended um, the ADAC should be, and then how much was actually paid in. And you can see that for almost every year on um, the actual amount paid in has exceeded the actuarially recommended amount. Um, that huge spike in 2022 is your $200 million one-time payments from Act 114. FY23 and FY24 bars, you'll notice that they're essentially level um, with uh, the FY22. They're very close to level. That is due to some of the benefits of Act 114. These are the, um, the actuarially recommended amounts. Um, the budget does fully fund um, the FY23 um, amount. It's, we won't be able to do the math on how much was fully contributed until the books close for the fiscal year. What this doesn't show is the plus payment. So on the on top of the FY24 numbers, you would add nine million on top of those. But I wanted to show the actuarially recommended amounts in isolation of the plus payment. So you can see the fact that those blue bars in these last three years are basically flat and you're seeing very minimal growth where you would normally expect to see 3% growth every year. All right, so we get a little- this is very busy. And we're almost done. <laughs> we did a little math. So and, and, There's a lot of figures here. Friends, yeah, so. I'm going to cut right to the chase. But you know, we did a little math and said, all right, what if we didn't have Act 114? And and you know, not actuaries here, but let's isolate the impacts of Act 114 from all the other experience losses we had last year. And um, by you know, our, our estimate shows that instead of reducing the unfunded pension liabilities by 144 million, they would have increased by 133 million. So the state system, uh, the whole would have got deeper by 95 million. The teacher system would have got deeper by just under 38 million. So I took those numbers and I recreated the amortization model that the actuaries use and tried to replicate, all right, if we plugged another number in, um, instead of what they what they provide in the valuations, what would our payments look like? And uh, you can see, <clears throat> take a look at the pink and the, and the yellow. The pink is what, um, what would the payments be if there was no Act 114? And you would have seen, I would expect the state employee ADAC would have been 140 million 
and the teacher's 218 million. The yellow column shows what it actually is, including the plus payments. So um, instead of dealing with 140.5 million ADEC for the state system, we're dealing with 122 million. So you add the plus payment on top of that, the $9 million plus payment, and your total employer pension cost would be 130.9 million, roughly $10 million less than um, it would have been had there been no Act 114. Um, so the plus payment is more than paid for in that system. Similar story with the teachers. Um, you know, instead of seeing a, we would have expected a almost $219 million aid act across all funds. And instead we're looking at 194.3, add on the $9 million plus, the 203.3 is $15.5 million less than we likely would have been paying had the legislature not acted last year. That's a pretty interesting story to tell. That's a good story. So this just kind of visualize, visualizes the plus payment and the future growth on your amortization schedule moving forward. You can see um, that, you know, had there been no plus payments, the dollar values in those blue columns would have increased by 3% a year um, in future years. You know, you can just look at first glance, those blue bars are not increasing by 3%. They're increasing by a much lower rate. This is what it, it looks like where you're paying a little more in the future years and the positive benefits of that are reflected in lower future ADAC payments. So you're essentially flattening out the cost curve over a period of time. This chart's real busy, but I just wanna show you, I tried to cram a lot on one slide here, but the pink diagonal is what would the future payments likely be if nothing um, changed last year legislatively? And the columns show you the reality we're looking at today based on the FY22 valuations. Where's the pink? Yeah, they don't oh, I'm sorry, the, the dotted pink in the background there. Um, okay. with the, the dotted line that goes kind of like that. The, 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 the one going this way. And, and the one, okay. The name yeah. is over the 216 yeah. points. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, but yeah. You can see though that the gap between what we likely would have paid and what we could expect to pay now gets pretty striking when you move closer out to 2038. The arcs that curve from the left down to the right corner shows you the unfunded liability balances. So the dotted is under the hypothetical, what if nothing happened? The black is showing what we're expecting now. So the, the story you see there is we're paying the balance off faster than we otherwise would have been. Similar story for the teachers. I'm not going to dwell on this, um, but you can see the same data just updated for that system as well. Membership trends, um, both systems have discontinued to mature. Um, that means, you know, we, we're getting more and more people getting benefits out of the system um, relative to active members who are currently paying in. Um, the, the ratios are pretty close to equal in both systems now. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot of massive spikes in the retiree population from year to year. What you're really seeing here is the maturing of the workforce. And these are broader demographic issues that have been playing out in places all over the country. Chris, is there a ratio for that pay to active that actuaries like to see? Yeah, not necessarily. This is a good indicator of just different systems behave differently. So if you're a really new system and you don't have to, the, the VMER system is a good example. They have a much lower ratio oh, of retirees. That's municipal. Just yeah. to let you know, Beamers. Yeah. What's the Beamers stand for? Exactly. And, and what that means in practice is, you know, there's a lot less cash flow demands on the system. Um, it can influence how you invest your money sometimes. You know, if you're a system that is relatively new and not very mature, and doesn't have a lot of people who are currently drawing benefits out, you could probably manage your money in different ways than if you're paying $200 million out every year and you really need to prioritize your liquidity. As a system gets more mature, it gets harder for a system to improve its situation through investment gains alone. The, for that very reason, you just more cash is going out of the system. So how much are we paying now? on an annual basis. It'd be a nice number to just to tuck in the right. Uh, the state system, retired member and beneficiary data for everybody, the state system is paying out $175 million a year in benefits. 
And for the teacher system, this doesn't sum, but the service pensioners, 224 million plus another 3.2 for disability pensioners, plus another 8.3 for beneficiaries. So you're looking at around 230 million out of this. So this is this is your last chart we're looking at. Oh, we've got OPAP next. Yeah, but this is the, <laughs> but this is the oh. retirement. Oh, oh yeah. The OPAP is the really good story. Oh. <clears throat> so given what where we were, the actuaries, when would we have run out of money in um, in oh. each of the funds? Good. And based upon what we've done knowing that we still have a ways to go, where would we run out of money? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you know, the answer would be that the only way you would run out of money is you, if everybody stopped paying into the system. I mean, I, I don't I don't want anybody to, who's in the system to think there was a danger of the system imminently running out of money. I think what the reality you would see is the bill um, handed to the legislature every year to maintain the system would just grow more and more every year. Because well, that's with a, with the commitment that we would continue to grow like that. Unless you reduce spend, but yeah. Well, unless you, but there there had to be a period of time that if we did nothing, we bought ourselves out into the future with this. So I don't think it's an unfair question to ask that if we had not acted, um, the funds would have reached a place so and, and that's not saying that there isn't commitment because <laughs> we've acted in it and there is commitment and we've shown them but yeah I, I understand your question i think the only way though i that that situation would play out again is if you would have to have the state not making any more payments yeah um and because the the math the the gasd rules require us to be honest about trying to fund our liabilities and uh, it, it's just a matter of the lower the asset balance gets in the system, the greater the unfunded liability and the greater future budget pressures would happen. Um, it could end up, and this has happened in places, where the hole gets so deep that you can just never afford to make the payments you need to dig out of that hole. Has, uh, I mean, cities have it's happened in, sm in some smaller cities. I always think so. It's, it's, and you know, it's important to note that states cannot declare bankruptcy, um, but there are some smaller um, communities. Yeah. Central Falls, Rhode Island, was on. The city of New York was on, on, on the ropes. And, and, and the city of Philadelphia and many others, the city of Detroit. Um, but states cannot declare bankruptcy, municipalities can. Um, so that is not an out um, for, from these uh, unfunded liabilities. Um, but yeah, I, I think it realistically what ends up happening is if you deplete the assets, you end up forcing yourself into a Vago situation. And that's just not, that's not good for anybody. What building would we sell first? <laughs> the billion? <laughs> the billion. <laughs> so where we, we could sell Orleans now? County um, to Canada. All right. All right. Did you just say it's about the airport? How much would Troy do? How much would Troy do? I bought for that. There you go. <laughs> the Canadian All right. Right. Well, the OPEB. Right. So part of the OPEB's a shorter slide deck. Um, OPEB, just a quick reminder, OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits. It is a fancy way of referring to subsidized health care benefits for retired members. Um, this is a really interesting story. <laughs> OPEB liabilities decreased by 42%, $1.2 billion across both systems. <laughs> That's net of all factors. And the reason why was because Act 114 established pre-funding for these benefits. So um, as Senator Kitchell mentioned, prior to this, um, we've been funding these benefits on, on a pay-as-you-go basis. So the bill for the, the current year's premium payments for today's retirees is what was being funded. Unlike pensions, there was no systematic socking away money over the course of an employee's career, investing that money, and then having a chunk of change at the end of their career to fund their future benefits. Um, but now, Act 114 established pre-funding for both of the OPEB systems. <clears throat> this, uh, the pension systems are uh, scheduled to be uh, fully funded by FY38, the OPEBs by FY48, so it's a little bit longer of a time horizon. And we're at the very beginning of the process. Sorry, what, when are you? 2048. Um, but something I'm definitely not going to be around. I'm going to have somebody's mail. We're going to put you 
what you want to see too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the biggest benefit we saw in the OPEP systems, though, was by pre-funding, the uh, GASB accounting rules allow us to use a higher discount rate when, when calculating all of our liabilities. So if you're not pre-funding, you have to use a rate that's tied to the 20-year AA municipal bond rate, which was around 2% uh, and super, super low. Um, now that we uh, can, now that we're pre-funding, the rules allow us to calculate all of our uh, liabilities by using a 7% discount. <clears throat> so that by itself um, reduced the unfunded liability balance by about one and a half million dollars. It's a huge amount. And, and that is that reflects the fact that the practice now is systematically setting aside money, investing that money, and you're going to have a return over time on those dollars. Pension systems typically about 60% of the cost of paying out their benefits comes from investment gains. So that's why pre-funding is, is smart long-term for the taxpayers. I'm gonna put that on my tombstone. Huh? <laughs> oh really? I thought you were gonna put, oh, don't okay. defer a debt oh, unpaid man. is a debt. What is that? Yeah, 1.5 greater than the 1.2. You'll see, because there were other factors that caused losses. Chris can come up with a really complicated chart to put on here. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few, there's a complicated chart and a few slides. Well, yeah, no, I, but this is why, for me, dealing with the healthcare benefit was so important yes. as we were trying to address the, um, the, the underfunding situation. And so um, it, it just, it seemed like we really needed to seize the moment and we had some <clears throat> had money in the way in which we could work it because this really, and, and this impacts so much. So um, uh, the task force this is something we kind of added on uh, right at the very end, but I, uh, but both the NEA and the BSEA were very uh, supportive of, for obvious reasons, to give that kind of security around those benefits. Chris. Um, the difference there is a the pre-funding is not the same as the plus payments. No, 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 no. Right. So the pre-funding we will still be calculating what that is each year, right? Yeah. That, that's a that's a great question. So the plus is just on the <laughs> underfunded <laughs> uh, pension. Correct. It just depends <laughs> on the pension. Right. On the old, that's that's what I thought, but. We could confuse them because they're both kind of paying the debt. No, but that's a great question because it's a perfect segue to talk about how these obligations are calculated and paid for. Is um, the OPEB uh, uh, funding system will work just like the pension funding system does? So um, there's an ADAC that the actuaries calculate that reflects the normal cost plus a payment toward amortizing your unfunded liability by the date. Um, on the state side, Costs are paid through a blended rate that's charged to the funds that employ the active payroll of state government. So about 40% of that cost tends to hit the general fund, and then the rest gets paid out of the special funds and federal funds and in proportion to how they support the active workforce. On the teacher side, the normal costs are paid out of the ed fund because that represents a cost of compensating today's workforce in the future. And the unfunded liability cost is paid for out of the general fund. So, so OPEB for teachers will be paid for out of the ed fund. And is that the normal cost? Normal, normal cost. the normal cost. Okay. So that's already figured in when we're looking at what surplus we have at the end. So it is. Yeah. Okay, it's, great. It's been worked into the end fund uh, forecast. And do we have a notion of what OPEB is going to cost us this year? Uh huh. We do have letters from the treasurer, okay. um, and, and we do for the ADEC as well. We do, and, and I will have that on a future slide. But yes, we so do. you're not you're trying to keep our hearts steady right now. I'm gonna leave you on the edge of your seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta keep you away. You know? This is just it's so exciting. It's just wanting you back. Oh yeah. Here's, here's the visual of the benefit. Um, you can see that really drastic drop in liabilities from year to year. Um, but you'll also notice that. The asset balance is pretty sad right now because we're just starting pre-funding. Um, so we've got a, a long way to go. Um, just like with the pension systems, uh, you know, investment performance did fall a little short of um, expectations uh, this year, but since there's so few assets invested, it didn't have a huge 
um, financial uh, impact. Uh, something I, just, I really want to stress this bottom uh, bullet point here that, you know, we saw the, the funded ratios improve a bit. Um, you know, we're now at 11.5% funded for the state, 5% funded for the, the teachers. We are at the beginning of a long journey here. So um, do not get discouraged by seeing the funding requirements increase every year and it not feel like we're making a lot of progress. Stick with the course. Um, the progress really shows up in the last few years. Right, we won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> like, <only> that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a pretty good healthcare benefit. Everybody. Yeah. Oh, gonna... <laughs> so just real quick, what's happened in, in sort of the state system? Um, you can see that uh, the state OPEB system, rather, um, to to uh, I think it was Senator Perchick's question um, earlier about if uh, we had a benefit of one and a half uh, billion from changing the discount rate, why did the total net change be less? It's because um, we also saw some other factors happen in both systems. So just like with the pensions, experience cuts both ways. You sometimes have gains and losses from year to year. Um, on the state system, uh, changing the discount rate saved 770 million. That was <clears throat> offset a bit by just updating your per capita claims rate, um, updating your retiree contribution rates and your healthcare cost trends. Um, you know, all of those little tweaks that happen from year to year. Sometimes either will add or subtract from your overall um, net impact from any one factor. Um, but you can see that net of all factors, the total liabilities decreased by $686 million and the unfunded portion of that decreased by 670. So that's a pretty impressive story to tell. Something just a caveat around all of this is predicting healthcare costs over the long term is notoriously difficult. And all of these calculations are pretty sensitive to changes in your healthcare cost trend rates or your uh, assumed rates of return. So just to give you a sense of magnitude of what a 1% increase or decrease um, in either uh, the discount rate or your healthcare cost trend rates would be, uh, you know, that influences your, your, asset, your, your net, the net OPEB liability, the unfunded liability by like $100 million. So you can have some pretty wild fluctuations. So 1% is $100 million. Like one cent on the ad fund is ten million. Something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can keep those kinds of things. I can keep. Similar story on the teacher system. You can see that um, you know net of all factors, all of your uh, liability assumptions decreased the um, liabilities by six hundred and five million dollars. That discount rate change uh, resulted in a seven hundred and thirty five million dollar benefit, but. You know, that was undercut a little bit by updates to healthcare cost trend rates and so on and so forth. But still here, net of all factors, your total liabilities decreased by 532 million and your unfunded liabilities decreased by 557. Something that happened here and not in the state system was as part of Act 114, this system received a $13.3 million one-time payment from the Ed Fund to begin pre-funded. Um, before, um, you'll notice that there's not a lot of assets in this system. Um, the state system had more assets because um, they benefited from a year-end construct that deposited 50% of undesignated um, general fund surplus in the state open system. So they got like $52 million at the end of FY21. That was more than enough for them to begin pre-funding. Um, Act 114 changed that year-end construct. So beginning with the end of this year, instead of that 50% of the surplus going to the state OPEB, that 50% is now divided equally between the two pension systems. So as more of that money materializes, it will further enhance the pension system's funding status. <clears throat> to Senator Clarkson's question, do we know how much this is gonna cost? Yes, we do. So this FY23 is the first year of pre-funding OPEB on an ADAC schedule. Um, we just got the numbers in for FY24 um, from the actuaries. Um, these might be subject to a little budgetary adjustments when they figure out what the offset from uh, LEAs on federally funded employees are. But you can see both in dollar terms and as a percentage of pay that you're looking at um, uh, uh, roughly 10.5% of pay for VSERS for the state employees. And for the teachers, it's um, it's just shy of 9% of pay. It's a little bit more expensive than PAYGO was. It's on average about 4% of pay more expensive than PAYGO was. 
But over time, it is much more efficient for tax dollars to be pre-funding because again, you're setting it, you're building up a pool of assets over time that is just going to be invested and further grow in the future. So yes. may I ask, well, uh, sorry, I mean, I'm maybe a little dense here. What, what does that translate to in terms of dollars? Uh, so for FY24, across I all- see, I mean, I don't have the printout. So yeah, for, for FY24, across all funds of government, for state employees, the total OPEB cost would be around $67 million. Um, and for the teachers, it would be $61 million. That's and the to, to Senator Kitchell's point, there, you know, the overall intent of Act 114 was some of the savings that uh, were made on the pension side created the fiscal capacity to take on the additional cost of refunding the OPEP. So, you know, low cost comes down here, and then you can use that freed up capacity to deal with the higher costs needed to prefund these benefits. Not uh, just the AJAC, not the <coughs> part that this. Employers, employees are putting employees in. don't pay toward OPEB. O employees oh, pay toward the premiums once they're retired. But the, when the employer or us put in money, that's different than this. This is the employer contribution, just the yeah. budget amount, not yeah. that. This is both. So this will show you as a percent of payroll and as a dollar figure. So you should expect, if all else is held equal, the dollar figures will increase by three or three and a half percent a year. And, and that's because payrolls assume to grow all the time. So that's why I like to show both the dollar figure and the percent of pay because the dollar figure doesn't really tell you the full story. It doesn't give you the context that the percent of pay figure has. So, yes. So the, it, it's, the state is the payer. Yes. In both the retirement and for active teachers that it, um, I think you would get an argument about who the employer is. I think the local school board would say they are the employer and sign the contract. That that may be the case, but for, for our purposes, employer means it's not the employee. No, it's the employee, employee employing entity. The employer in um, um, the, the state is the payer. The, for for most employees, the exception is if you have federally funded staff in your school. Um, the, but, the LEA but, pays but some federal funds the, for those. The vast things. majority are the people that the contract that is signed by the local school board. Yeah, we fund the benefits at a state level, but the state does not um, make the employee decisions at the local level. That's so a good point. And that was part of the, uh, um, was a number of years ago where um, the general fund was picking up all the retirement that paid back for current teachers, and we moved that um, to the ESMA because the local schools determine the number of teachers hired, they determine the salaries. So really, their decision, their, the, the obligation was being created there, and it really was part of the um, cost of operating the school. This is the normal cost mm -hmm. current. So that's the important thing we did not in any way impose the underfunding responsibility onto the ed fund. Was that another reason we went to state by contract for health insurance for teachers? No, this was that separately. Was just this is just a separate discussion. Um, uh, but um, it, it, so uh, some people, I, we're so sensitive about how we use the ed fund and what we put onto the ed fund. And so mm -hmm. it was um, at normal costs are really the costs associated with operating your schools and that includes you know your leave benefits to everything else um, is funded through and in some ways um, there's some discussion some people would really like to have um, those costs reflected in local school budgets so people can really have transparency around what is the total cost of that particular school year um, which um, <laughs> Is another discussion, but not part of uh, today's. So this is this is uh, hopefully helpful in terms of where we are from a year ago. And, and I just have like three more slides. I'm going to blow through them, Senator. Oh, that's that's good. Good. These are just uh, the quick. Uh, what do we look like? What, what are we? Okay. All right. I apologize. Well, we'll see. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. Well, we will see yeah, because obviously we have to budget the 
the A deck. So I, I ran some some uh, projections, just sort of assuming everything's going to be held constant. You know, payroll's going to grow like we thought it would. Everything else, and these would be the checks you're looking at. Nothing uh, is constant. Nothing is life. nothing is constant. But the best I can do is work off the assumptions, and they're long-term assumptions that are subject to annual change. <laughs> but <laughs> you will see here that um, on the top chart here, you know, through FY22, these numbers reflect the actual contributions into the systems. Yeah. Uh, we were funding these benefits erratically, not systematically, on a pay-go basis or whenever general fund surplus or one-time dollars materialized. But moving forward um, from sort of FY24, that's what the GASB would expect our uh, contributions would be. And then the 25 and beyond were my projections by applying that same rate of payroll to an assumed rate of payroll growth. But you'll see that, um, especially in the bottom charts, that uh, the, the way things kind of settle out is in both systems, you're roughly 4% uh, of payroll higher um, in costs under, under pre-funding than you are under pay. Now. And again, that's because there is a cost associated with that big buy-down of unfunded liability on our balance sheet. So what if, just like with the pensions, what if we didn't do anything last year? On OPEB, um, the Act 114, I expect had a positive impact of $781 million on the state employee OPEC system. And you can see here that just the impact of the discount rate change was $770 million. There was also a smaller change around um, benefit terms that had to do with uh, the changes to the law enforcement um, mandatory retirement age um, going from 55 to 57. But if you just back those factors out and sum things up again, um, you know, you would have expected uh, and, and held everything else constant. These liabilities would have increased by another $95 million instead of decreasing by $686 million. Um, so we would have had a much different story here. Similar, similar on the teacher side, um, you know, just reducing the discount or increasing the discount rate um, due to pre-funding resulted in $735 million beneficial impact. Um, the one-time appropriation also increased assets by 13.3, back out both of those factors. And you, I would have expected that the liabilities would have increased by $230 million. Moving forward, um, the normal cost needs to be paid for the foreseeable future um, in order to pre-fund the benefit. That is how you're setting aside money to make sure that the active workforce has a funded benefit when it's time for them to retire. The unfunded OPEB liabilities are on track to be skip, to be amortized uh, by 2040, meaning that's when we would be um, expected to be fully funded. Assume the payments are gonna grow roughly at pace with payroll. And just like with the pensions, you're gonna see these numbers change from year to year just based on what's happened in the system um, and their experience. You're gonna have a, you know, you should expect some unfunded, some negative amortization to happen in the near term, where you'll see the balance increase a little bit while your payments are first starting to catch up. But then toward the end, about halfway through, those unfunded liability lines really start bending down. And just like with the pension systems, most of your progress payments toward really paying off the unfunded liability happen in the last few years. So that's my way of saying, don't get discouraged again. Expect the bill to keep going up incrementally from year to year. You're going to say, why is this number not getting smaller when the bill keeps getting bigger? It will like 2040. It will in 2040. Well, it'll happen a little before then. But when it happens, it'll really, really drop. But around then, it's going to take a while. It'll take a little while. <laughs> All right. um, thank you for joining us. I, we thought it would be good to... Yeah, um, oh, this is great. Uh, great to follow up. Some that not a lot of money. Flash. We heard from several yeah. relevant parties yeah. earlier today. Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. All of them said they had the best benefits in the world. And we said we'd like the same ones. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I did for any benefit. <laughs> for any benefit. Well, we have a bill on that. Would you like yeah. to We're working on it. We love it. co sign. Yeah, I'm sure people, when they look at their 401ks um, on an individual basis, would be seeing <laughs> somewhat of an impact in terms of our current economy. Yeah. So, 
Um, all right, well, we may have a little bit more to do. Um, we'll have to see. We have some. Yeah. Um, see how much more money we've got. To well, fortunately, we used some of our one time money to really start paying down our debt, yeah. and that helped us um, put idea. this all together. And um, we could have scooped it and used it, and said, but we said, no, we need to deal with the uh, with the health care piece because with the higher contributions and stuff, maybe if we could have taken that lower A deck and not used the money in the way we did. But the, the, the package was put together to really look at. Yeah. Um, well, long term, but you did really good work and you gave us time to think about this. But I think your point earlier in this is when we have freedom in the budget, and if we do come to a place where there really is some surpluses out in a few years, this is an area that is going to have to continue to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, if, we have to be <clears throat> about this. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I may just add to that, Senator. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point, Senator Westman, one thing is to keep in mind is the unfunded liability is a debt that is owed to the pension systems at 7% interest. And uh, so that sat 7% forever? No, it's based, that's the current discount rate based on the assumed rate of return. How often is that? When you owe millions at Depends on who you ask, but it's typically following an experience study. So the last time was after FY20. Uh, and that was when we got hit. It's not big. 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 That's what started all of this. Wow. This is the B word. Oh, well, yeah. we've been, some of us have been laboring on this video for a while, particularly moving, getting the teacher's retirement. Uh, normal, uh, 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 one other thing I wanted to mention, Senator, was since um, you all passed Act 114, um, I know at least um, S&P has um, increased its um, outlook for the state from negative <clears> to stable, citing oh, that as other factors. We did not increase our bond rating rate, but the fact that the outlook changed is a big thing. And uh, Moody's identified this as a credit positive, so uh, this is this has not gone unnoticed. S and P went from what to what? From a, a negative outlook to a stable outlook. And these were cited in the CDAC report. That's really that's great. Man, it's an improvement. Stable is perfect. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for having us. Thank you. This was great. <laughs> Maybe more opportunities. Yeah, no, it's not. Okay, okay, I'm gonna have a 